It, good evening all. It is a pleasure to see you. Um, friend, can I have the next slide? Thank you. So, so friends and fans of health affairs know by now that I almost never speak without mentioning our unique structure, which is shown on this slide. Encompassed within health affairs, as Maggie said, is is the College of Health Sciences, which of course includes the medical school, the nursing school, the school of pharmacy, the future school of uh, public health, and our Integrative Health Institute. Then there are the UCI institutes um, and centers of health and the delivery system. And we are an alliance across the disciplines, a collaborative powerhouse. And we call this One Health because it's only by bringing all of these parts together that we can truly affect a future of good health for everyone. Now, another aspect of this is end to end, from undergraduate education to the frontiers of health research to care in the community, we support a discover, teach, and heal mission. And this is a virtuous cycle because as we discover and we teach and we cure, we learn more to come back and do it again, discover, teach, heal, which gives us continuous quality improvement in each aspect of the tripartite mission. Next slide, please. There we go. So this is a map, well, it's not a map, it's a picture of the Health Sciences District. Over the next four years, health affairs will have expanded by 2.5 million square feet. And I love this view because it shows the One Health doing it better together concept in physical form. You see in the lower corner, the new Susan and Henry Samueli College of Health Sciences building and the new Sue and Bill Gross Nursing and Health Science Hall building. All of this within a mile of the new medical center we're building. And this is, 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 is bringing together all of the entities into one growing place so that we can study together, care together, and learn together. And, and I have a hunch for some of you, buildings may not be as exciting as people, but really this is our lifeblood. Imagine 18 year olds and 22 year olds entering these buildings and a few years later, they emerge as nurses and doctors and pharmacists making breakthroughs to save lives. And in fact, if I can have the next slide, two weeks ago, these buildings opened up. And students, as you can see in that upper corner, are in the new space. 50 classes are taking place in this building now. There are 10 classrooms. There is a 200 person amphitheater. And amazingly down in the corner, you can see our simulation center, which is a high quality um, uh, environment. Those mannequins look like they might be what you put clothes on in the store, but in fact, they are $150,000 robot machines. And when the students touch them, we are controlling what happens, their heartbeat, how they feel, how they respond, so that we can train teams of students to work together. And it's videoed so that afterwards they can sit and dissect what happened and learn from the experience. And in these rooms, we can bring together and will bring together the nursing students, the medical students and the pharmacists, because only in that way can we give the best care to all patients by teaching them to work as teams. And I emphasize all patients there, next slide, because we are very dedicated to health equity. And it is one of the three strategic pillars of health affairs. It is a priority that spans the Discover, Teach, Heal mission. And I hope maybe you've seen some of our Bridging the Gap newsletters, which come out every six weeks or so. You can find it online. And here are examples of some of the things we have emphasized recently. Food insecurity, innovations in nursing to address health disparities, 
problems of grouping together Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, if you want to look at data to understand the effects of different ethnicities on how care is being delivered and how patients are responding. And we will continue to ad address important issues like we will tonight. There is, as usual, too much to tell you, but I wanna move ahead to the highlights of tonight. And I have the opportunity now um, uh, the pleasure to introduce to you Dean Mark Lazenby, the, or Dr. Mark Lazenby, the Dean of the Sue and Bill Gross School of Nursing. Now, Dean Lazenby is a professor of nursing at UCI. He began his lifelong pursuit of positive social transformation in Southern California, working as a community organizer with underserved youth in East Los Angeles. He brings with him a belief that the profession of nursing is a powerful driver of social transformation, particularly for health equity and planetary justice. As an international expert on the psychosocial spiritual cancer care, Mark has studied the support of cancer patients from minority religious uh, backgrounds, as well as the implementation of emotional distress screening in routine cancer care. His research has been funded by the American Cancer Society and the National Cancer Institute. He's a past president and fellow of the American Psychosocial Oncology Society, a fellow of the American Academy of Nursing, and a powerful member of the Health Affairs Cabinet and the One Health Mission. I suppose it, I, sh I would like to add as well that he also has a doctorate in philosophy and brings that sort of incisive thinking to everything we do. Please welcome Dean Lazenby. Thank you, Vice Chancellor Goldstein. It's my pleasure to introduce, introduce tonight's topic and speakers, three wonderful speakers from the College of Health Sciences to address the issue of health equity. Let me describe what health equity, equity is using a common example. It is an example of three people trying to peer over a fence. Let me use this example from my own family. My cousin was six foot two. He could peer over the fence without any assistance whatsoever. My older brother happens to be about six feet tall and he needs a box of about two to three inches to be able to see over the fence. I, on the other hand, am not called shorty for no good reason. I need a box of about, oh, six or eight inches to be able to see over the fence. These different size boxes illustrate what different people need to achieve the same health. And that's health equity, giving people what they need to be able to achieve health. And some people need different things, sometimes more things. And that's the size of the box we're here to discuss tonight. First will be Dr. Nakia Best, an assistant professor of nursing, who will discuss the importance of school nursing in achieving health equity, as well as academic equity in um, school aged children. And then Ariana Sapasi, an assistant professor of pharmacy, and pharmaceutical sciences, who will discuss the kind of health literacy that people need, depending on whether they're an immigrant or US born. And finally, um, Dr. Jose Mayorga, who is an assistant professor of medicine and the direct executive director of UCI's health family, um, UCI's family health center, a federally qualified health center, who will give us in, in complete detail what people need to have culturally appropriate care that is accessible to them. So three different examples of different types of boxes people need, depending on who they are, to achieve the same access to health that you and I have. Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over first to Dr. Nakia Best. Hello everyone, good evening. Again, my name is Nakia Best and today I want to talk to you about the important role school nurses have in improving health equity and student access to healthcare. 
Uh, first, I want to uh, provide you with some background about school nurses to give you some context. Next slide. So in fall 2020, about 56 million kids um, attended public schools in the, in the US pre-K uh, pre through grade 12. Um, more than 40% of school-aged children have at least one chronic health condition. So that's asthma, diabetes, um, other physical conditions, um, behavioral learning problems. The healthcare needs of children with chronic illness can be complex and continuous and include both daily management and addressing potential emergencies. Next slide. Through all the services they provide, school nurses assure that all children have access to appropriate educational opportunities, regardless of their state of health. School nurses incorporate health education into every interaction they have with students, school staff, and families. They are key to making the school a safe place for students to learn and include some that I've listed here, like direct care for acute needs and emergencies, quality improvement to find the most efficient services for their student population, and advocating for safe quality healthcare in schools. They also supervise school staff that may assist with uh, administering medications and other things that the students need. They also communicate with kids, their families, pediatricians, and do lots of staff training. Next slide. There's also this natural connection between school nurse services and addressing social determinants of health and health equity. In fact, school nurses can increase health equity. School nurses act as a liaison for students by coordinating across systems of care for children's access to health care, nutritious foods, et cetera. Next slide. With all that nurses can do in schools for the kids, families, staff, and school communities, we should have a nurse in every building. In fact, the National Association of School Nurses and the American Academy of Pediatrics recommend that all children should have daily access to a nurse. But only 40% of schools have a full-time registered nurse on staff. So now I want to describe findings of two studies I've conducted in North Carolina that showed the impact school nurses have on student outcomes and how school nurse workload is associated with medication errors. That should make us really think about why we don't have a school nurse in every school if you haven't already been started thinking about that. Next slide. So when examining the impact of school nurse ratios on student health and education outcomes, and a ratio is uh, the number of students assigned to a nurse, uh, we found when nurses were assigned fewer students, students, students had improvements in how they were able to manage their chronic conditions and also improvement in their educational goals, such as with these kids where they had asthma or diabetes, they were able to accurately understand their asthma triggers and just understand the pathophysiology of their disease process. They also were able to be able to test their own blood glucose and correctly count count their carbohydrates, which is all very important in figuring out how much insulin they need. And for the educators out there, we were also found that when the nurses were assigned fewer students, that the students uh, with these chronic conditions had decreased absences. Next slide. In this next study, we first looked at how many students had doctor's orders for medications they could receive while in school. And you'll see on the left, left hand side of the screen, out of 1.4 million kids, about 30,000 um, on average every school year had orders that they could see, receive long-term medications. So that's probably like half or either all of the school year, short-term medicines and emergency medicines. And also recognize that there's like 242,000 kids every year that have been diagnosed with at least one chronic, chronic condition. And the uh, 6,400 kids that had school nurse case, case management. And that school nurse case management is like a one-to-one -one program. So you can see how many other kids are just trying to figure this out um, without having that one-to-one -one management. And so then we looked at, uh, for associations with medic medication errors. And I want to point out one particular finding. When there were more schools in a district, we found a higher number of errors. And it wasn't just the obvious, 
like more schools equals more errors. But it also was about when there are more schools in the district and there's a shortage of nurses, that means nurses are responsible for more schools. They're in more buildings. And all of these different schools have different kids and different medicines and different staff to train to give the medications when they aren't there. Hence, more errors. Next slide. Now, I'm super excited about a study I'm working on now, diving into associations among Orange County child health needs, services the school nurses in Orange County provide, and social determinants of health. Evidence shows that over the last two decades, we've witnessed a reduction in inequality in access to care for pediatric populations, yet there's still substantial racial, socioeconomic, and geographic disparities in access to childhood health services. And there's a limited body of research that suggests that disparities in access to care are partially addressed by school nurses, especially among students of color and those from low socioeconomic statuses. So in this study, we'll be filling that gap in research in Orange County and then taking what we learned to look at data across California. Next slide. Thank you so much for listening to me about talking about the important role of school nurses in improving health equity. And here you'll find my email address and my Twitter handle. Thank you, Dr. Best. Um, I had, so I, I have one question for you. I'm looking at the q and I have one question for you before we move on to the next speaker. The the students who had to manage either asthma or diabetes, it was that, that having a school nurse helped them to stay in school and this is what affected their, was it that they were present more often and this is what improved their educational outcomes? Yes, exactly. So, um, we, so it's in the literature that kids with chronic conditions will may miss more school because of issues they're having with their chronic conditions and by providing that one-on-one -on -one care or that one-on-one -on -one time with the nurse learning about their process and helping them manage everything, they were able to meet goals of, um, of being in school more and having decreased absences than the previous school year. Very good, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Without further ado, we'll move on to our next speaker to stay on time and this is Dr. Ariana Sapasi who will um, give us a, a talk on her research on health literacy among um, immigrant and US born racial ethnic minorities. Dr. Sapasi. Thank you, Dr. Lazenby. And thank you everyone attending. Um, it's great to see such interest in this topic of health equity. And thank you, Dr. Best for uh, presenting with such crucial and imperative research, especially relevant for today. Um, what I'd like to talk about is a study that I actually finished wrapping up a few months ago, so it's not quite published yet. So everyone here is going to get a little sneak peek. Um, so uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So before I kind of get into the slide, I did want to highlight sort of the motivations for the study. So my parents are immigrants. Um, my grandmother was an immigrant too. She passed away a few years ago, but she didn't speak English very well, right? Um, I think most of us who are first generation born children of immigrant parents can sort of relate to that experience. And thinking about that sort of as someone who does research kind of led me to this question. So I guess we could start with what is health literacy, right? So it's very it can get very convoluted, but if we were to really distill down what the definition is, it's essentially two parts. The first part is with the patient. So how well is a patient able to access information related to health to form their own decisions? And the second portion, if you will, really has to do with your health system, your doctor or your insurance company, and how how well or how proficient are they in providing you that information that you need? So historically, it's important to note that this definition was more limited to patients. We put a lot of responsibility on patients being able to obtain their own information, when really now, more recently, we've sort of added in this additional responsibility for providers to, able, to be able to provide that information. And the reason that I bring up my grandmother is because I watched her navigate very closely with the U.S. health system in the later years of her life. 
And it was difficult for her because she didn't speak English. So her ability to obtain information was quite low in comparison to someone who perhaps has very fluent proficiency in the English language. So prior research has shown us that the higher one's health literacy proficiency, the higher their likelihood of adhering to preventive care. So these are people who are more likely to see their doctor for yearly checkups. They're more likely to get their regular vaccines. They're more likely to be adherent to their medication. Overall, they're, they do a pretty good job of maintaining their own health care. Um, and we know from this research that minority groups, so racial ethnic minority groups such as um, Hispanic or Latino patients, Black or African American patients, and Asian American or Pacific Islanders uh, tend to have lower health literacy rates uh, in general. And this is due to a number of factors, right? And I'm kind of going to discuss this after the fact, but you know, how can we address those factors given the results of this study? So then, you know, thinking about my grandmother, I thought, well, what about the effect effect of being an immigrant, right? So being an immigrant and a minority puts you at an even higher likelihood of certain factors, right? So if you're an immigrant, perhaps you're less likely to speak English fluently compared to someone who was born here. And I thought this was important because we tend to lump racial ethnic minority groups into this one large category when it comes to research. But I think it's important to highlight the nuances in this large group, which is what the study attempted to do. So I and my collaborators, we use data from the United States, so a very large representative population, uh, and we identified patients who reported themselves as immigrants and patients who reported themselves as U.S. born. And we looked at racial ethnic minority patients only. Then we created a model, a mathematical model, to predict their health literacy score. So this is Health literacy is something that you can technically score. There are many different ways of measuring it. We used one specific method. And then we just compared the two. So we said, okay, well, compared to US born minority patients, how did immigrant minority patients fare? Uh, next slide, please. So we had three main findings that I'd like to highlight here. So the first finding is that being a minority immigrant put you in a 81% higher prevalence of falling into a below basic category of health literacy proficiency. So this is the lowest category out of all when you look at health literacy scores combined. 81% higher prevalence compared to U.S. born racial ethnic minority patients is quite a substantial figure. We also found that being an immigrant had a negative, significant, and direct effect on your health literacy proficiency. So that means that it doesn't matter what your English, how, how good you are at speaking English. It doesn't matter what your education was. It doesn't matter what your income level was. Simply the effect of being an immigrant puts you already at a disadvantage when it comes to health literacy proficiency. And this was something that was specific just to immigrants. And finally, we found that uh, a substantially larger number of immigrant minority groups fell into this below basic category overall. So 5.6% U.S. born minorities versus 14.3% of immigrant minority groups fell into this lowest category of health literacy proficiency. Now, obviously, a lot of this is attributable to the fact that immigrants perhaps have lower English proficiency. So we demonstrated that in our study, but it's also due to a number of other political um, sort of policy making effects that we can address ourselves. Um, so next slide, please. So I'd like to kind of round out this discussion talking about the context of these results, because I feel like it's very important to discuss the implications of what we found. So I'd like to point out that these results really highlight this need that we've had recently to put this responsibility of promoting health literacy out of the hands of the patient and into the hands of the provider. So ourselves as pharmacists, we're considered to be the most commonly accessible healthcare provider. But you know, many of our patients, they don't speak English very well. And, you know, pharmacy students as well as pharmacists can't be expected to be fluent in every single language, right? So what can we do as healthcare providers to specifically target these minority immigrant patients to help them feel more at ease when they're coming in to pick up their medications? What can we do as healthcare providers in general to make our patients feel more at ease in this sense? So research has also demonstrated that racial ethnic um, minority patients in general tend to feel a sense of shame when they come in 
which is related to lower health literacy proficiency. So they might feel afraid to speak up or they might feel like uh, their doctor or their pharmacist or their nurse is looking down on them to some extent. So what can we do on our end to try and sort of bridge this gap that we found in this research? Because this is a disparity. This is a health equity issue. Um, the concept of health equity means that we want to be make sure that all patients have a right to uh, proficient health literacy. So that's sort of kind of the open-ended question that this research project rounds us out with. So what can we do? Um, I personally don't know the answer to that question right now, but that's something that we're looking into. Um, and for me, myself, I come from a health policy background. So what I'd really like to focus on are what can we do from a policy perspective to sort of bridge this disparity gap? So that was quite short, but uh, thank you for the opportunity to discuss on uh, my research with regards to health literacy. So, uh, Dr. Lazenby, I'd like to, I guess, punt it back over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sapasi, and it's very important work. We have um, some questions in the chat, mm -hmm. and um, one of them is relates to both Dr. Best's work and your work. Just what can be done, um, and you you opined that you're, you're not totally sure yet, you're, you're the ever careful researcher, but if we're talking about health literacy, are there ways we can talk about health conditions or in your case as a pharmacy, in pharmacy and pharmaceutical sciences about medications? Mm -hmm. And what kind of literature do we hand out to people and in what languages? I know when I get medication, I get a book sta uh, stapled to it but I don't always understand everything it says. And I'm a healthcare professional. Right. Um, sometimes I feel the same way and I'm a pharmacist, so I completely understand. That's actually an excellent question. So, you know, I think most of us have picked up medications from the pharmacy and what we usually get are these big chunky package inserts or pamphlets that have very dense paragraphs of text. And many of us, again, we already feel daunted. You know, I look at that and I feel like I need a nap, you know, it's just a lot of information to take in. And some of us may even feel like we're, we, we're hesitant to ask the pharmacist because they're just so busy all the time, especially in a retail setting. You know, we may feel like as patients, we're being rushed perhaps. And, you know, my suggestion from the patient side is to not be afraid. Always ask, right? Always, you're your own best advocate. But from a pharmacist side, there are many things we can do. So as you mentioned, the research. So the research has actually shown that quite effective interventions are visual methods. So just a picture helps a lot. A picture says a thousand words, and I'd say that's proverbially correct. Some medications have very complex scheduling regimens, for example, steroids. And even just drawing out how many pills you take mm -hmm. Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, is so effective, no matter where this, whether this person speaks English, whether they've just had a high school education or a college education, no matter their background. So I think that's a very simple and effective method that perhaps we could study further that could be implemented quite easily. Uh, thank you. That's a wonderful example. A picture gives them that access to taking their medication correctly that otherwise they wouldn't have. Thank you very much. Um, we will come back to more questions and answers at the end of the of the presentations. But next is Dr. Jose Mayorga, who is the executive director of Family Health Center of UCI's federally qualified health center, which is in Santa Ana and Anaheim. Uh, and this will be an example of how we're taking healthcare to communities and delivering it in ways that make sense to them. Dr. Mayorga. Thank you, Dean Lazenby. Thank you once again for the invitation. You should be seeing on, on the screen a beautiful entryway into one of our federally qualified health centers here at UCI Health. Uh, it gives me great joy to kind of give you a perspective. What are we doing to address some of the disparities that our communities face, those that are under-resourced or under-supported historically? So let me walk you through that over the next few minutes. Uh, the team that does great care to many here in the county. Um, I always like to kind of start with some really interesting facts that may not be related so much so to healthcare, but I think we could draw some correlations. So for every two minutes that the sun is shining, 
it produces enough energy to power the entire world. Now think of that, about that for a moment. You have probably in front of you numerous electronic devices and to know that is absolutely amazing. Now, we know the, the one thing that's consistent about the sun, we all expect it to do it, is that it's gonna rise and set every day. We would hope that other things would be just as consistent or as available as the sun rising and setting, such as access to, to potable drinking water, access to healthy foods, access to healthcare. And so what I'm gonna do over the next few minutes is cover a few things we're gonna cover fairly qualified health centers, their history and the role in health they play. Uh, we're gonna talk about the population that we serve at RFQHC here at UCI. I'll describe a little bit of the care team model approach that we do deliver the care here at our centers. And then lastly, highlight some really, what I consider innovative interdisciplinary examples of the entire health sciences coming together at UCI to deliver this healthcare. Now, I'm not much of a history buff, but I know this is a very important gentleman. This is President Johnson. He was very monumental in healthcare for two reasons. One of them is signing the Medicare Medicaid service bill into law. The other one was signing a very important Economic Opportunity Act that was part of his State of the Union address back on January 6, 1964, at which point 19% of the population here in the US were living in poverty. Within that act though, he wrote the bill that would allow the federal funds to, to go to medi medically underserved areas to open up these particular health centers known as fairly qualified health centers. Now, these were really important because at the time, his administration got wind of, unfortunately, an increase in death rates amongst Black African-American babies in the Mississippi Delta area. This really impacted him and the rest of his administration and gave them even more drive to try to ensure there was funding to give access, not only to those children once they were born, but also to provide that prenatal care those mothers needed ahead of time. Now, the concepts of medically underserved communities or FQHCs or community health centers did not necessarily stem from the United States. This actually dates back to the 1940s where Two doctors, uh, husband and wife team, were tasked to care for a Zulu tribe nation in South Africa. Now, what was unique at the time was they decided to ask the community, what is it that they needed to be healthier? They didn't go in here thinking that they knew everything. They actually solicited information from tribal leaders and others to ask, what are those resources? What are those things preventing them to live what they would consider a healthy life? Now, this is a foundational stance of all health centers that are now known as FQHCs, simply because we asked the community, what are the things you need? And many people from across the, the world came there to train with doctors' carts. And one of these gentlemen was Dr. Jack Geiger, who brought these concepts back to the United States and gave birth to this federally qualified healthcare system. Now, one of the most interesting things about all this is that no matter which FQHC you walk into, if it's in California, Puerto Rico, Alaska, Louisiana, we all have a fundamental mission. We will provide care, even if the individual does not have the ability to pay that day. That is a mantra, that is an absolute mission of every FQHC in this country. We're located in medically underserved or under-resourced communities. We provide an array of services such as medical care, oral health, behavioral health, visions, and social health services. In calendar year 2021, a collective of about 1,400 FQHCs across this country delivered care to over 30 million individuals. That's one in 11 individuals living in the United States and its territories. That's one in eight children. And that's one in every five person who is uninsured in this country. Now. I will tell you that this is a great thing that we're here to support our communities because by and large, FQHCs as a collective group do a better job of delivering health services to this community than opposed to those who get, get it outside of an FQHC. We manage chronic disease better. We provide better preventative health care and ensure people are on the right medications at the right time. 
and delivering it in a culturally sensitive manner. Now, the other wonderful thing is that we provide excellent prenatal care and have great birth outcomes where children are actually born at the appropriate birth weights. Now, you're probably wondering how expensive this all is to the healthcare system in this country, because we all have heard time and time again that our healthcare system is broken, it's gonna bankrupt us. But if you look at the simple savings that is given per patient, per visit, per year, it is astronomical how much money these health centers are saving in the tunes of over $35 billion a year. Now, it's a very unique place at an FQHC. And if you've seen one, you've only seen one. But I'll show you how ours really delivers care here in Orange County for the last several years uh, since 1985. Now, we are the oldest FQHC in the county. Our oldest site in Anaheim started back in 1978. We were designated in 1985, as I shared. But we've had various monumental moments in our history where we've expanded our services, particularly over behavioral health, and that's what that blue oval is, but really started transitioning and delivering more care than just the medical, uh, addressing things such as educating folks how to cook healthy, expanding our services even further in Anaheim, and doing a massive move, improving the health of our patients' oral, over, oral cavity, ensuring that they had good oral health. We are the oldest. We train so many individuals here from our resident physicians, our medical students, nurses, pharmacists, a, an array of individuals that come and train here. Uh, we serve an enormous amount of individuals. Uh, we are the largest primary care footprint between these two sites. And if you take a look at the sheer numbers on your screen, we've grown year after year since 2018. And from 2020 to 2021, we grew by over 1,000 patients and delivered over 11,000 visits. This is all associated with the movement of the pandemic as we know. Many individuals lost their insurance. They had to convert over to Medicaid or Medi-Cal, or some of them just simply weren't un uninsured, period. We have enormous amount of conditions we serve, but predominantly serve those individuals with these conditions, which is high blood pressure, diabetes, depression, anxiety, and of course, overweight and obesity. Now, we have two buildings. We have approximately 200 individuals working in these buildings collectively. We have to be innovative because we cannot see everyone. We cannot see everyone every day in our clinics, but our mantra, our focus, has always been not just to deliver medical health, deliver behavioral, oral, and social health to ensure the overall population remains healthy and keep them healthy so that do, they do not end up in our emergency rooms and hospitals. Now we do this in a very unique design. And I think this is a very proud moment to share because we do this with our support staff. We do this with our pharmacists, our social workers, our care navigators, our nurse practitioners, and our physicians. Collectively as a group, we're delivering care to an individual and, it's, and their families. And that innovation stems further because we know that many of our population learn from each other. And part of that innovation involves group medical visits. Now these pictures are a little dated, pre-pandemic, but we're excited to bring these visits back now that it's a, a safer stage in this pandemic. We're gonna be bringing this back, teaching our patients about concepts of mindfulness, de-stressing techniques, things that they, they need and have uh, used in the past to help improve their overall health. Now, as a family physician, I enjoy teaching my patients how to pre be preventative, eat healthy, but it is no good if I can't teach them how to cook it. And so our teaching kitchen uh, is soon to be reopened and it's a wonderful gift by the, by the Samuelis uh, who have donated uh, the efforts to building this kitchen. And we're so excited to reopen this and provide it as a resource to our community. Now, I'll be remiss if I didn't share a little bit more about our innovation, because this is where the, the excitement is at this point. I cannot do the work I do every day without my entire care team together. And collectively as a group with our nurses, our support staffs, our pharmacists, we've done some really innovative things. We bridged not only the healthcare disparities, but also the technology gaps that some of our patients are facing. Those are remote, remote patient monitoring devices that you see, a blood pressure machine and a scale. 
And as I'm speaking to you today, if you were my patient, I could provide you this blood pressure cuff and it would instantaneously send me the information so I could make a better, better decision on your blood pressure. Now, I'm proud to say that a lot of this innovation has, le has led to research, has led to publications and poster presentations of the efforts collectively as an interdisciplinary team, leveraging technology both virtually and in person, and really leveraging each other's skill sets from our clinical pharmacists to our nurses, to our nurse practitioners and physicians. We've absolutely demonstrated improved outcomes in a matter of just three months. People who've had challenges with blood pressure have, have definitely improved and we're excited to continue to expand this effort because we know it's reducing their overall risk of future heart attacks and strokes. Lastly, I would be remiss if I didn't say we have to prevent diabetes. And again, a collective interdisciplinary approach with our clinical pharmacists and others. We've been monitoring uh, some glucose uh, initiatives for pre-diabetics to see, right, could they make a difference? Would they make positive behavior change in order to better their health and avoid getting that diagnosis of diabetes? And we've definitely have seen great, great feedback from our patients. And we're excited to see what is to come further with this type of technology being used in our type of setting. Now, all this great work has come with great accolade and recognition nationally. And I'll, sh I'll share this slide here because I think that that gold seal at the left-hand side of your screen illustrates how much effort, how much love and passion our team has for our community that puts us in the top 10% of all federally qualified health centers in this country. We're in the top 10% performance. And so I'm very proud to share with all of you that we are absolutely addressing the disparities addressing the social determinants of health for a very unique population that is historically under supportive and under resourced because we do want to be as consistent as that sun that rises every day providing that clinical health care they need. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mayorga. And I do see questions in the chat, but before we get to them, I'm going to introduce um, Dr. Bernadette Bowden Albala who is the founding dean of UCI's School of Public Health and Population Science to give us her take on tonight's lecture. Dean Bowden Albala. Thank you very, very much. I'm really uh, pleased and honored to be here and to be sort of closing this all up. And this is a really important area that we're talking about. And how do we think about putting this all together? Uh, really thinking about health equity, thinking about um, social justice. It's the core of everything we do here at the College of Health Sciences and, um, and the UC healthcare system, and of course, working with our community um, in public health, at, just like I think in nursing and pharmacy, clearly, Dr. Mallorca talked about this, um, for the FQHCs, are really the mission is to integrate health equity into everything we do. That means we need to value it and we need to move towards first um, more meaningful and sustainable relationships with our community because we can't achieve health equity if we're not working and partnering with community and not in isolation. And um, those partnerships, of course, are partnerships that we see in the clinical setting as exemplified uh, by Dr. Mallorca, but also in the research setting uh, where we can start with describing disparities, moving to understanding the mechanisms within which these disparities occur, and finally thinking about um, implementation, trying to find out, trying to really hone in on the ways in which we can really move towards achieving health equity, whether they are out in communities with continuous blood pressure monitoring, or whether they are thinking about um, policy initiatives. And so research is critical in teaching. And I know that in curriculum here, thinking about interprofessional education, um, uh, across the College of Health Sciences, learning from each other what we're doing, how we're changing curriculum to incorporate a health equity, a diversity and inclusion framework. And then in the service that we perform 
at the university and out into the community. And we have to acknowledge that we can't move forward with health equity without knowing that we have to tear down structural barriers. And um, one of the things that we've done under um, the direction of Dr. Goldstein um, and co-chaired by myself and Chad Left Terrace is, um, is put together a health equity uh, College of Health Sciences and health system wide um, or group that has been thinking about recommendations to help move us as a large team, all of us together to move towards health equity. And finally, I want to say, and, and more to come on that, as, as uh, Dr. Mallorca and, um, and uh, doc, Dr. Best and others talked about, innovation is really important. And I'm just going to end by saying that when we think about innovation, we have to think about taking areas that seem very, very different and putting them together towards health equity. And so the um, Institute for Precision Health, which we are really, uh, again, under Dr. Goldstein's purview, um, is bringing together uh, groups that are interested in um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data, together with health equity and thinking about how we can use all the data that we have out there, partnering with communities to really achieve social justice and health equity. And so I would just turn it back to you, Dr. Lazenby, a wonderful series here today um, and such an important topic. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Bowden Albala. Um, I ask the panelists to now uh, turn on their cameras and join me in answering a few questions. Um, I will begin with a question from uh, someone who's listening from Ghana, um, and it is for Dr. Sapasi. Um, uh, the question is why you categorized in your study based on whether or not they were uh, a racial minority of, of uh, immigrant or US born rather than educational status? That's a very good question. It kind of goes back to what was the whole impetus for the study in the first place? Like, why did we choose to look at immigrants versus US born minorities? So I looked at this purely from a United States perspective. So our population is very mixed, right? We're considered like the melting pot of nationalities in different um, population, so to speak. But I think that specifically in the United States, there are certain uh, policies, right? So kind of at the federal level that impact immigrants in a different way than they do U.S. born um, sort of folks, right? And I think that was one of the main motivators as to why I wanted to investigate this question in the first place, because those are policies that perhaps um, perpetuate the discrepancies or the disparities that we've seen. So if we can demonstrate that using this research, we can perhaps address those policies at a future date. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Best, a question, there, several questions on when your Orange County study will be done, which you can answer in due course, but um, there is a question that's more about how we can be advocates. So uh, we know that school nurses improve the health and the educational outcomes of school children. How do we get more school nurses in schools? Any thoughts on that? Right. So school nurses are hired by different entities, and it's usually by um, the school district. Uh, it differs by school district, and funding differs by school district. So I would say first, find out if there's a school nurse in this in your school where your kids are going or your friends kids are going is there a school nurse in there that works full time and i think that's the individual citizen can get involved at board meetings finding about like what's the budgeting for our school nurses in that um that's where i would start as a citizen i thought um, yeah i know in north carolina where we have um a few of the school districts that have a nurse in every school it was the parents that got involved at the board meetings. Yes, it's different from the federally uh, qualified yeah. health center movement, which is a federal movement. Because schools are run by communities, we have mm -hmm. to advocate locally. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Mayorga, several questions for you. 
One has to do with the, the scope of care that you provide. Is it just primary care or do you provide specialty care, say like cancer care or um, care for um, heart disease? Yeah, so uh, fundamentally FQHCs are expected to deliver primary care services, which includes pediatrics, general OBGYN, as well as family medicine or adult care. Here at our FQHC, and it, we actually offer acupuncture. Uh, we do have a psychiatrist on staff, uh, and we do a higher level or subspecialized in OBGYN care. Um, if we do identify patients with uh, concerning illnesses that require specialty uh, care referrals, we have either we have lots of partnerships in the community. Um, obviously, some of our patients are insured, so we're able to refer them appropriately. Others who are uninsured. We have mechanisms to refer them to specialty clinics in the county that see uninsured patients and provide those services. So uh, we we have that luxury here in Orange County. I can't speak to other counties per se, but I, I'm very grateful that we live in a county that has ability to navigate uh, patients like that to higher levels of care. Very good. There are um, there is one other sort of question that's this access how. How can people access the health centers and um, like transportation, et cetera? And uh, along with that for me is why are you located in, in the places where you're located? Yeah, so, so uh, let me start off by saying California has the largest number of fairly qualified health centers in the, in the country, uh, but three times more than the next largest state, which is Texas. And it's, it's population-based. Uh, you know, we are specifically located in what is deemed by the federal government as a medically underserved area. Just to give you an idea of what that means, I'm sitting in my Santa Ana clinic right now. And in this clinic, within a mile and a half radius, are five other FQHCs that are not affiliated with UCI. Just, just appreciate the magnitude that the people in Santa Ana are facing. That means there's a, a higher need to service a, a medically under-resourced or unsupportive community. So it's really based off of demographics, people's social status, and living at a certain level of poverty where these centers tend to be, be established. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, the, so these FQHCs are in the community and they, they are of the community, but there's, there's a question here about how can, um, well, what do the providers who, who provide this primary care look like? Do they look like the community? And, and um, uh, can you talk about that and talk about how the training that you deliver helps um, sort of address the issue of provider patient cultural, um, speaking the same language culturally? Yeah, it's absolutely important uh, that we we look, we sound like our community. I know that's a challenge per se. I mean, I think some some of us on this call or presentation know that there's a significantly large shortage of physicians in general, as an example, but even bigger shortage of Latino or Latinx physicians like myself uh, to service the population that is continuously growing here in California across the country. So representation is important. And we do have special programs at UCI to help expand that, such as our Prime LC program. Now, those who may not be of the same culture or ethnic background of, as our patients, a lot of them choose to work here because they have an affinity and a passion to deliver care to that community and historically have done so. And so they learned the language or have spent time in those experiences learning more about the community and, and being able to service them. And I think that that's what makes our two sites so special. The people that work here want to be here. And for many that love to train here, they, they come to and ask to train at our health centers because of that experience, because they know our commitment is to the community to drive home the fact that we could reduce healthcare disparities amongst those that have the biggest gaps. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. And I've seen it in action. It's really quite uh, wonderful. Um, this goes to all of you, and I'll begin with Dr. Best. It's a, it's a, it's a very important question, but what motivated you to do this kind of research? 
Well, I, um, I really saw all of the work that school nurses do for students and how the students' lives change when they're in the building. And I have an affinity for using data to, uh, to show the impact people can have. And so that's what I charge myself with doing, leveraging all this data and making it make sense and using it to tell a story. And uh, so that's, that's kind of where it started. Very good. Yeah. Um, health equity and storytelling with big data sets. Yeah. That's, that's a wonderful way of doing it. And Dr. Sapasi, you shared your um, immigrant story. Is that what motivated you to do this research? Uh, yeah, I would say your, your it was your family's a, immigrant story. Right? Yeah, not just my grandmother, but also my mother. She uh, she immigrated here uh, maybe forty or so years ago, and she still doesn't have a mastery over the English language. Right? She's fluent, but when it comes to healthcare terminology, like many of us, you know, she's just kind of in the dark. Um, and she's a cancer survivor and she has rheumatoid arthritis. So she sees the doctor very frequently and she calls me a lot because she has questions. So, um, I thought the best way that I can help out people like her in the future is by doing this research. So just like Dr. Best, I figured the best way for me to do that, the most efficient way would be to do it through research. So, hmm. and Dr. Maria Orga, um, uh, you could have practiced anywhere. Why at the FQHC? What motivates you? Well, uh, I will start off by saying as a UCI student, uh, I am an alumni of UCI. This was the first clinic and exposure to medicine that I had. And I was walking on this first floor and many of the individuals I saw with my mentor uh, looked and sounded a lot like my own family. And I could genuinely say that some of my family do seek care at FQHCs. Little did I know that back then, but now I do, that they continue to, to receive services there. So I think that's what has always motivated me. That's always what I've been excited to uh, give back uh, to the community because it really does look and sound like me. Uh, and that's the only way I would be practicing at this point in time. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you to all the panelists. And without further ado, I'd like to turn the evening back over to Carol Klein. Thank you, Dean Lazenby, for leading us through this very informative and thought-provoking discussion. I'd also like to thank our panelists, Dr. Professor Best, Professor Sapasi, and Professor Mayorja. Thank you for your time, your expertise, and your informative presentations. And thank you to our audience for joining us this evening. Um, I then remind all of you to keep an eye out for details to our first installment of the UCI Research Associates Madeline Martin Swindon Memorial Lecture Series in 2023. Um, it will take place in either February or March and more details are to come. And with that, I thank you again and bid you a good night. Mm -hmm.